Waldo Emerson once wrote that an institution is but the lengthening shadow of one man. This unquestionably applies to Benjamin Titus, B.T. Roberts, as he committed his labors and leadership to the foundation and early history of the Free Methodist Church. B.T. Roberts was born on July 25, 1823, in Cattaraugus County, New York. His parents were both very active and dedicated Christians. The Roberts family tree had been traced from two distinct sources in the Middle Ages history. One is from the Charlemagne family in Europe from the 8th century, and the other is from Alfred the Great of England from the 9th century. As a boy, Roberts was an exceptional student. By the age of 16, he was already teaching school while studying law under practicing attorneys. When God spoke to him of his need for salvation, Roberts offered himself on the condition that he be allowed to choose his life's work. But Christ demanded more. Roberts wrote, Christ demanded an unconditional surrender. I made it. The joys of pardon and peace flowed into my soul. Soon afterwards, he began his preparations for the ministry. Roberts entered Genesee Wesleyan Seminary in Lima, New York. After a successful year, Roberts was admitted to the Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut. That year, a revival swept the town and campus under the ministry of the doctor evangelist John Wesley Redfield. The impact was powerful. President Stephen Olin declared, This, brethren, is Methodism, and you must stand by it. Among the many students spiritually renewed was young Roberts. At graduation in 1848, Roberts qualified for the Distinguished Scholarship Award, Phi Beta Kappa. Later, the Wesleyan University granted Roberts a Master's of Art for his literary achievements. As graduation approached, Roberts was offered the presidency of Wyoming Seminary near Kingston, Pennsylvania. Now he had to choose between Christian teaching and a pastoral ministry. His university president, Stephen Olin, challenged him to the pastorate, saying that there are more who are ready to teach than to preach. Following graduation, Roberts met Ellen Lott Stowe, an attractive young woman from New York City. She was the niece of a high official of the Methodist book concern, and a romance developed. Roberts began his ministry in the rural town of Carryville near Batavia, New York. While there, he wrote his father, I am trying to give myself wholly to the work of the Lord. That year, he succeeded in winning the hearts of his congregation improved property and finances, and received 40 new members into the church. Here is the outline of the manuscript of Robert's first sermon. His text, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 8. His first point, what is meant by purity of heart? His second, consider the necessity of being thus pure in heart. His third point, endeavor to show that this purity is attainable. And last, advance some reasons why we should immediately strive to possess it. In May 1849, Benjamin Titus Roberts and Ellen Stowe were married by Ellen's uncle in New York City. The new Roberts were looked upon with such favor by the church that four Methodist bishops attended the wedding. The wedding trip took the newlyweds by riverboat to Albany, then by railroad to Buffalo, and finally by stagecoach to Gowanda, the Roberts family hometown. Following their marriage trip, the Roberts enjoyed the two months remaining of the conference year at Caryville. Roberts then was appointed to Pike, where the declining church preferred an older pastor. During his first year, Roberts struggled to overcome discouragement. As the year was coming to a close, a spiritual renewal came to Roberts at a camp meeting under the ministry of evangelist Phoebe Palmer. During this camp meeting experience, Robert saw two paths. One led to applause and popularity. The other path meant preaching the truth and suffering opposition. Through God's leading, he was given strength and chose to preach the truth and suffer opposition. At the next annual conference, Roberts was ordained a deacon and returned to Pike for another year. A revival eventually resulted in the construction of a second church in another area of the circuit. In 1851, Roberts was appointed to Rushford. The congregation was large but rather cold. Their indifference bothered the new pastor, 
but he quickly roused the Rushford congregation, and by the close of the year, a revival was taking place. During the next conference, Roberts was ordained an elder. He accepted his vows with a sense of great responsibility. Later, Roberts was appointed to Niagara Street in Buffalo, a leading city church in the conference. Although he was not anxious to move there, he did feel that it was the Lord's will. The year at Niagara Street Church brought heavy burdens because of the apathy and worldliness of its members. Roberts offered to clear the church's heavy debt if seats were made free, but the congregation refused. It was not long until Roberts left the church. Following his departure, the church was sold and used as a Jewish synagogue and later as a Masonic temple. At the 1853 conference, Roberts was appointed to Brockford. Roberts's journal reads, I have never felt less anxiety about my appointment, nor prayed more. I receive it gratefully as from the Lord. And again, revival came and the community was stirred. During Robert's next pastorate in Albion, where there was a strong church in excellent spiritual condition, he published an article in an independent Methodist paper. In it, he urged reform within the church, claiming that a group of Genesee Conference ministers had divided the conference by weakening Methodist standards of conduct, spirituality, and in doctrine. But the next conference held at Leroy officially denounced Roberts and his article. Later, Roberts was then sent to Pekin, New York. The Pekin Church, completed during Roberts' pastorate, is still standing. Though Roberts suffered from the conference's disapproval, he quickly overcame prejudice and won the people's confidence. Shortly before the 1858 conference, without Roberts' cooperation or consent, a lay minister republished the article that had brought Roberts under such criticism. The Genesee power structure, determined to kill any reform movement, made Roberts their victim and expelled him and other reformers from the ministry. Roberts had leading ministerial support. Among them was a Bishop James, who still saw in Roberts a bright future and a hope for reform. Unfortunately, Roberts no longer was a minister. What should he do? As a licensed speaker, he established a free church in Buffalo. He appealed his expulsion at the 1860 General Conference. Unfortunately, it was rejected. Roberts also had strong lay support, including Isaac Chesbro whose son later became publishing agent of the Free Methodist Church. If laymen had been permitted to vote, the reformers could not have been expelled. It was 50 years before Roberts was cleared by the church that had expelled him. At the centenary celebration of the Genesee Conference in 1910, this was said of Roberts and others who were expelled. Those expelled brethren were among the best men the conference contained, and scarce anyone thought otherwise even then. Truly she, the Genesee Conference, came out of a great tribulation, and it is hoped she washed her robes white. The climaxing event of the 1910 Genesee Conference came when the conference restored to Benson H. Roberts the parchments of ordination so unjustly taken from his father. But it came 17 years after Roberts' death. Soon after Robert's expulsion in 1858, reform efforts spread from New York into Illinois. Here the movement became an independent organization under the leadership of Dr. John Wesley Redfield, the same evangelist who had stirred Roberts during his time at Wesleyan University. The Illinois movement elected Redfield superintendent and Robert's general superintendent. However, no constitution uniting local churches into a denomination was accomplished. B.T. Roberts had not wished to organize a new denomination. He preferred that reforms be made within the established church, but in spite of repeated appeals, the Methodist General Conference refused to cooperate with Roberts. A fringe group of the movement began to resist control. Finally, Roberts was convinced that only the authority of a denomination could prevent extremism. On August 23, 1860, 60 members and laymen from New York and Illinois met on the peak in New York campground. Just before the general session, part of the group met informally to decide whether a new church should be proposed. Agreement was made, and later, the delegates voted their approval by a large majority. The August 23rd Convention adopted many principles for the new church. The convention ordered one general superintendent, later named Bishop. 37-year-old Roberts was elected. 
There is no record of debate on the naming of the new denomination, but already local congregations of reformers, among them the Albion New York Church, had chosen the name Free Methodist. Rented pews prevailed in mid-century America, and the name Free Methodist identified the new denomination's source in Methodism and indicated its pews were free to all worshipers. The Albion Free Methodist Church is still in use today. B.T. Roberts accepted a crushing load when he became general superintendent of the young church. As the church grew, the general conference enlarged the personnel of the superintendency to three. B.T. Roberts, E.P. Hart, and George W. Coleman. A religious encyclopedia of his day described Roberts as a powerful writer. One of B.T. Roberts' greatest literary achievements was the production of The Earnest Christian. For 33 years, he was both editor and publisher of this evangelical, non-sectarian family magazine. Roberts was also a brilliant, gifted speaker. Although very knowledgeable and well-educated, he did not parade his learning, yet he aimed his message directly to the people. Roberts was keenly sensitive to human need. He taught a black Sunday school class while in college. He was an advocate for abolition and rejoiced when Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. He opened a mission in his home in Buffalo, and he fought for free churches, where rich and poor alike could attend without discrimination. At its founding, the Free Methodist Church forbade its members to buy or sell any human being as a slave. A former slave owner of one congregation, though in slave territory, freed his slaves valued at $30,000. Within months after the church was organized, the Civil War erupted. Early in the Civil War period, Bishop Roberts was ministering in a camp meeting near Chicago. A special election had been called during this time to amend the Illinois state constitution to the advantage of slavery interests. Camp leaders closed the camp early so that voters could get home in time to vote against the proposal. On January 1, 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation went into effect. The next session of the Illinois Conference, by resolution, strongly approved the proclamation. Thus, the young church voiced its stand on human rights. Bishop Roberts used the Earnest Christian magazine to reach Civil War soldiers. Many were guided and comforted by it. The young church was a century ahead of its times in social concern, evident in the 1865 Illinois Conference Resolution. Resolved that we are in favor of having the Constitution so amended that nowhere in the United States shall the civil rights of any person depend upon his creed, condition, or color. The conference urged election to office only those who agreed with these principles and lived up to them. Although war ended in 1865, human hurts continued. Again, Roberts challenged the nation, urging the moral, social, and religious education of freedmen. He pointed out that the nation had denied these former slaves the means to gain education and culture. As all who were instrumental in the early Free Methodist Church, Roberts was well-educated and thought highly of intellectual training. So it was entirely in character for Bishop Roberts to create a school, adding to his many responsibilities. In 1866, Roberts gave up his Rochester, New York home as initial payment on a farm in North Chile, 10 miles from Rochester. Later, he purchased the village tavern to use as a school building. In doing so, he removed the tavern's influence from the community. Until the completion of their first new building, the former tavern and the farmhouse comprised the school. The school was named Chilai Seminary, later A.M. Chesborough Seminary, and is known today as Roberts Wesleyan College. Roberts felt preachers could learn much by self-study. He also felt preachers should have training in all fields, including science, literature, and mathematics. He maintained that every kind of knowledge can be used to win people to Christ. Roberts, like Wesley, emphasized the practice of stewardship. Wesley urged Methodist, earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. Roberts wrote, God does not require his people to take upon them vows of voluntary poverty, nor would he have them dependent upon others. It is as much your duty to work as to pray. Bishop Roberts was concerned about the nation's economy. 
In the 1870s, he organized farmers to seek legislation, guaranteeing that freight rates on farm produce would be no higher than rates on industrial products. A monument in Batavia, New York, honors William Morgan, a publisher who opposed the Masonic Lodge and was murdered in 1826 because of it. But by 1850, secret orders had regained much of their former favor and even large influence in some denominations. Roberts and the founders of Free Methodist claimed that oath-bound secrecy can lead to evil. The Free Methodist Church has firmly maintained this position. In the 1890 General Conference, Bishop Roberts pled for the ordination of women preachers. But it was not until several years after his death that women were given this privilege, and then only as deacon. In 1894, the Women's Missionary Society was organized with Mrs. Roberts as president. This helped women gain influence and increased means of service in the church. In his approach to holiness doctrine and Christian living, B.T. Roberts followed the Methodist traditions of John Wesley. Roberts maintained that, however, imperfect one may be in knowledge and achievements. The Christian may be perfect in love. This is especially evident through Roberts' own life and labors through the way he lived out his faith. During the 33 years of Roberts' leadership of the church, 29 Free Methodist annual conferences were organized. It is clear that Bishop Roberts laid a firm foundation upon which future generations were to build a strong church. He was near 70 years of age when traveling by train near his birthplace in western New York, he suffered a severe heart attack and within a few hours passed to his heavenly home. His last words were, praise the Lord, amen.